actually there's a really good example in India, which you probably saw recently, that one of the government health departments for COVID-19 started pushing homeopathy as a treatment that seemed very legitimate. And obviously COVID-19 is terrifying. People are scared. We don't know what's happening. But obviously someone with their own agenda in that mm-hmm. department wanted this accepted. It was an interesting thing because I thought that was an abuse of the department's function. But it was mm-hmm. irresponsible to communicate mm-hmm. that to the public. And you see it across uh, in, in America, Donald Trump naming different drugs, telling saying everyone should take them. And yet people did and people got sick or people didn't get any benefit. So I think that there is a responsibility, to, particularly in politics. Mm-hmm. You should be tied to the evidence. Welcome to another episode of Perseverance Overrated. Brought to you by My Bookworks, world's first recommendation engine-based book sharing platform. Hope you are all keeping safe, practicing social distancing, and giving ample exercise to your minds and bodies. In today's edition, we get to talk to an author whose bestseller has earned praise from none other than Richard Dawkins. The Irrational Ape is a journey of powerful anecdotes woven into a thoughtful narrative that investigates the illogical side of human beings. A diligent storyteller and a tireless communicator, Dr. David Robert Grimes is an Irish physicist and a cancer researcher. The Irrational Ape is his first book. In an era characterized by fake news, social media mobbing and reactionary behavior, David examines situations where our perceptions fail us, our biases overwhelm our cognitive capabilities and our need to react simply drowns logic and reason. Thought-provoking and engaging, the book presents principles of critical thinking that could help us as a species to contain and address challenges we face collectively and at an individual level. I discovered his book by sheer coincidence, but hopefully future readers amongst you will be able to connect with this book on purpose. Welcome to the show and it's a real pleasure having you with us on this episode. Thanks for having me. So how have you been? How are you coping with everything that's going on around? We, we live in interesting times, don't we? I mean, I am I, I this is this once in a lifetime experience that many of us will have. It, it's it's interesting in many many different ways. Some of them good, some of them bad. But right. I can't I can't complain about my experiences too much because I know other people are having it a lot worse. <laughs> so I won't complain. Well, I hope we learned something. I mean, if if nothing else, that maybe we should uh, still realize that we are still um, mm-hmm. vulnerable to nature. Yes. We think we think we're above and a part of it. Actually, we are very much at its whim. So there's a lesson here too. I'm I'm sure there is. To get started, David. I mean, this is something that was on my mind ever since I started reading your book. What really inspired you to write the irrational leap? I mean, it's it's such a fantastic book. There are so many anecdotes. It's it's written in such a compelling way, and there are so many sort of an you know, instances that you've quoted so beautifully. So, where did the inspiration come from, David? Oh, that's very very kind of you. <laughs> I think the the inspiration started from two different avenues. Mm-hmm. One of which was I, I do a lot of writing on uh, science communication and things like that. And one of the things I noticed, probably more of my skills as a writer or lack thereof, is that I often felt I was writing the same thing. Like if I was debunking myths about conspiracy theories, it was very similar to debunking cancer cures that weren't true or, or whatever else. Mm-hmm. And I suddenly realized that the problem, uh, there's commonalities to all these issues. There are a checklist of things that we get wrong as a species mm-hmm. including myself including the smartest people in the world the dumbest people in the world they're common to us as humans uh, and i kind of wanted to write um a book that people could go oh this will help us you know think a bit better but the second part is my my background before i was uh, a scientist i was an actor and a musician and i i also from my sins i'm irish we love a good story humans okay. You don't we learn from textbooks for the technical information. But if you want to connect and understand something, you need stories because right. stories are how we understand the world. And it makes us vulnerable to things. If people tell us a scary anecdote, it doesn't matter how true or not it is, it makes us a bit afraid. But it can also be used as a force for good because if you're trying to teach some something technical and you put it into a story or an analogy or a metaphor, that mm-hmm. as humans we understand. So these two kind okay. of things came together to inspire me to put ideas together. 
so there is there is an allegory part of it and then there is the narrative which is the storytelling i assume uh, so these two tracks ran in parallel in your mind so to say absolutely in fact you need you need both because otherwise yeah. you've written a textbook um mm-hmm. and and that that would be useful but you're not going to capture people's hearts and minds with a textbook unless it's a really good textbook <laughs> and i don't think i'm able to write that so oh come on david you have a <laughs> modest there but uh, that that brings me to the second question david which basically is that i mean i've i've read a lot of stuff that you've written even outside as well where you're talking about uh, anti vaxxers and you know this misinformation web that has been spread around uh, all mm. of us right so that has really attracted a lot of attention recently because of everything that we have heard about the covid-19 pandemic from 5g being responsible for oh, yeah. this particular pandemic in some way to you know absolutely ridiculous documentaries been re- released talking about theories which are preposterous to say the very least why are we so bad as a species at weeding out misinformation you know this is something that has always intrigued me well i i think a lot of this goes back to the fact that we are social animals i mentioned earlier that stories matter mm-hmm. and we have this image of ourselves as like being cold or rational creatures in some ways we are not all uh-huh. of us are are prone to to subscribe to anecdote and mm-hmm. and to weigh more information or sorry, weigh information more heavily if it's got a human element to it a classic uh-huh. example as we've seen in the era of social media the kind mm-hmm. of posts that go viral that go mm-hmm. travel spread around on they're more emotive they're scarier they appeal uh-huh. to us on a more visceral level Mm-hmm. and in that way social media has really helped accelerate the amount of misinformation uh, because if someone shares something that's very very frightening we are mm-hmm. more inclined to suspend our critical faculties and more inclined to share that because we're afraid of it so uh-huh. that's the survival part of us that we 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 we're reactive we kind of react before we reflect which okay. is good in some ways but does us a lot of harm in other ones and i think that's part of the reason misinformation spreads it's also if you think about it it's a lot mm-hmm. more appealing for example if you spread a conspiracy theory that's exciting mm-hmm. and it it gives an intentionality and everything is very you know neat and mm-hmm. in reality the world is chaotic and things happen and sometimes no one is planning them at all mm-hmm. that's a lot less sexy a story to share <laughs> so human club stories which means misinformation will always mm-hmm. have a place so learning to spot it is very important oh that's very interesting i thought that david the part about survival instincts kicking in so would you like to also say that this is this is our reptilian brain so to say that is at play mm-hmm. here um well i only have a reptilian brain so i can't come <laughs> on other people but I, i i think i think it's 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 a maladjusted instinct there's nothing wrong with it the fact that we're emotional and mm-hmm. you know are 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 sentient apes in some ways is a beautiful thing about us it's one of the reasons we have connections and emotions and art and all that kind of stuff and even science to some degree but the problem is that those good things can be manipulated or misdirected by people um who are either misguided or who are more sinister if we can't think critically and we can't see past misinformation we can be manipulated by people that know how to control us and we see that in politics we see that in science mm-hmm. and so it's really really important to even though we will always be have a part of our brain to mm-hmm. also realize that we have the other part the part that can you know think stop analyze put mm-hmm. these emotions in perspective mm-hmm. uh, because otherwise if we just went by our emotions we'd basically be oversized toddlers all the time <laughs> uh, we need we need the rational part to work too god that david and taking that to or rather extending the context david if you look at something like a flattered conspiracy theory so to say which is catching up off late and you know you keep bumping into it if you are on youtube for various reasons oh, yeah. i don't know why so something like that where where there's a mountain of evidence or even the uh, the moon hoax landing conspiracy and things like that where there is a mountain of evidence where there is so much information already available and there are so many credible people who have spoken about the fact that you know there is no conspiracy there it's all truth that's the way the planet really is and that we have gone to the moon there is absolute evidence of uh, we being there so how about those kind of theories uh, david which are absolutely ridiculous where you know it takes some effort to even subscribe to something like that what about them what 
what could possibly explain these theories becoming more prevalent i think there's a, an interesting factor there and i i kind of i touched it in the book a bit because it's it's when i started writing the book i didn't mm-hmm. actually give enough credit to the psychological motivations behind things because mm-hmm. i i was doing a thing that scientists often do and sometimes wrongly that oh we'll just look at this in cold hard logic but you have to understand human motivation too. So let's say um, there's a great documentary on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's on Netflix in India, but it's certainly on the one here called uh, Behind the Curve. And mm-hmm. it's a fly, fly on the wall documentary of flat earthers. The reason I think it's really interesting and I recommend watching it is I deal with conspiracy theorists all the time. And okay. one of the interesting things that they all have in common is the people that are most perpetuate these theories, the people mm-hmm. that share them the most often, they're often driven by two things that are interesting and cycle firstly it's an appeal to a simple narrative like stories are always even if they're convoluted they're simple there's a there's a good guy there's a bad guy there's you know it's it's very clean and even right that's mm-hmm. one thing so mm-hmm. there's an appeal to superficial you know uh, appeal to what seems parsimonious but there's mm-hmm. also a bigger factor if mm-hmm. you believe in one of these things and you mm-hmm. become big in this community and you evangelize and people go oh he's you know spreading it's great for your ego you Uh suddenly think like you're someone that knows things you're a respected person it happens in the anti-vaccine community it happens in the flat earth conspiracy um all these conspiracy theories the people that become the evangelists Mm -hmm. are largely motivated by a sense of ego they feel special they feel they have a special knowledge that makes them superior to the deluded academics and normal people and whatever else. And that is undeniably alluring. If, mm-hmm. if you suddenly think you're special and all your community <laughs> of YouTube followers think you're special, that mm-hmm. makes you feel good. So there's a okay. human element to seek out the urge to feel good. Um, okay. It's just strange that to the rest of us, it just looks crazy, but it does okay. make them feel good. But the other side of this, David, in terms of looking at how much science has progressed in the last couple of decades you know there's been a huge leap of imagination and reality as well with you know quantum physics becoming such a prominent branch of science and then transition of mathematics into the realm of big data so to speak so going back to your uh, theory about these people uh, assuming that they have a certain special knowledge that they need to be proud of or feel better or feel unique about so shouldn't knowing something more about say Uh, you know, quantum physics or about, you know, something about the universe or something, you know, some theory that no one's not, which which is not really in common knowledge, like say string theory, for instance, from a common man perspective, for instance. So what do you say about that? If, if, you know, somebody knows that, shouldn't they also become uh, or rather feel better about themselves? And and shouldn't that become the dominant thought paradigm? I I think so. And I think, look, there is a certain well-being um, mm-hmm. when you are educated on something. We all feel good when we've learned something. That's totally normal. That is human. Um, mm-hmm. But I think sometimes there's a differential about. Mm-hmm. So the most clear example we have of this and the most studied is the anti-vaccine community because they do so much damage. A lot of people right. have spent time studying why they perpetuate things. And you might say, well, wouldn't an anti-vaxxer get the same satisfaction you know, learning about immunology and learning about disease and then being able to share. share. But that's hard. Science is kind of hard. Like if you want to learn about string theory or you want to learn about, (laughs) you know, immunology, that requires a huge amount of effort. One of the things you'll find about a lot of these theories for the most part, like the the pseudoscientific ones, is that they are intuitively easier. They are narratively simpler. And they don't require complexity. If you want to learn about string theory, for example, now I I am a physicist by training, but Mm -hmm. like if I open a textbook on string theory, my brain starts melting. It is hard, right? (laughs) There's, there's a, but if, if you say, so say you're in the anti-vaccine community. Uh Now you want to learn a bit about immunology and about antigen binding and all that kind of stuff that requires a lot of work. What is easier to become an expert, it requires a lot of work. And you, you, you get an, a feeling that how much you don't know. Sometimes when you're learning, the most horrible feeling is, oh, my God, I know so little. Like, and that's part of learning. Um, the, it's, it's the Dunning-Kruger curve. It's when you go up and go, I think I know a bit. I know nothing. You know? And then I go, I know a little bit. But 
I think if you look at, say, for example, anti-vaxxers, their narrative mm-hmm. is very simple, but because that's easier. So you can put mm-hmm. them in a room with the world's greatest immunologist or an expert on medicine or whatever else, and they will still think they know more. It's like ah. if, you, if you want to use a Star Wars analogy, the dark right. side is the dark side is quick and easy, and the light side <laughs> takes a bit more work. So th- there's a little bit of that. Um, they, they they're still getting that sense of satisfaction, but they okay. do so at the cost of true understanding. Ah, that's nicely put, actually, David. What do you feel about the role that religion plays in all this? Because that is a that's another complex factor that sort of you know. Uh, complicate things complicates things to a larger extent and it is something that though it's it's becoming you know easier for science to explain mm. so many things around us but still uh, there is this tendency to fall back on religion as uh, the dominant source for explaining the quote unquote truth and uh, i keep seeing uh, dr uh, richard dawkins uh, neil degas trice and, and everyone else explaining things in such a fascinating and you as well david you have even you have this tendency to break things down uh, to such an extent as well but even if the narrative becomes such such simple for everyone of us to understand as well still there is this tendency to go back to religion and uh, you know adopting a stance which is slightly contrary or completely contrary to what science informs us so what's the take on religion uh, david is is it something that is essential uh, as a force uh, that you know binds some set of people or is it something that divides us and keeps us away from understanding the larger truths uh, that are yeah. out there that's an excellent question um someone very close to me is doing their phd in this they're studying the psychological roots of religion and, and how it affects interpretation and stuff and i'm in a weird situation because a lot of people close to me are religious and a lot of them aren't uh, uh-huh. myself i am very much agnostic i don't personally believe but i don't mm-hmm. write it out um, so when it comes, but I grew up in Saudi Arabia. I grew up in a theocracy uh, of Wahhabi Islam, which is a very hardcore version of, of Islam that right. also affected all the laws. And mm-hmm. in Ireland, for many years, the Catholic Church ran things over here and affected all the laws as well. Mm-hmm. So I think it's possible, like Stephen Jay Gould said, that you can you can avoid a lot of the religion and science conflict by just talking the fact that the science talks about the testable. And religion talks about the non-testable where they become in when they where they become in conflict Mm -hmm. is when you when like let's say there's an actual fact and Mm -hmm. your your religious belief doesn't allow you to accept that fact well that's a problem you know but for me i I, it's a really good question because i asked my friend who's who's doing their phd on this what they thought about this question um a few months ago their answer was to say it depends it's really complicated depending on the people so i think that in some cases, religion could absolutely trigger, trigger irrational behavior. If you deny reality to preserve your belief, that mm-hmm. is irrational. But if you hold a religious faith that isn't in conflict with any of the facts you observe, mm-hmm. um, one of the most interesting versions I saw of this, I worked with a guy when I was in, in Oxford, brilliant guy, excellent scientist. Mm-hmm. And we, we did a cancer a bit of cancer work together. Um, and he personally, for religious reasons, he didn't mm-hmm. believe in evolution. He didn't believe in evolution. Uh, which which was fascinating because the work we were doing was on cancer cell evolution and i asked mm-hmm. him about this mm-hmm. and the way he he squared this logic was he goes he goes i believe cancer cells can evolve but i don't believe god wants people to evolve that way and he compartmentalized oh. his beliefs so it didn't get in the way of his work but i just found that really now i i think sometimes that would get in the way of your work but mm-hmm. for him he had found a way to compartmentalize the cancer cells from people and i found that was really an interesting insight i don't understand it but i think it Mm -hmm. depends on the people to a huge way the interesting aspect that i personally felt here david is that from the spiritual side of things and from the science side of things at at a certain level when when we dig deeper and deeper into science and uh, get into you know physics at depth i mean i see that a lot of the answers that come out from science are no less different from the experience that spirituality actually delivers to some level hmm. it's it's equally engaging it's equally mystifying and it makes you believe that you know there is definitely a method to the madness around us no matter what you look at it or whatever you want to call it so i see that you know both of these like you said can exist in parallel can be compartmentalized uh, but where i see the similarity really you know occurring is that 
uh, when when somebody speaks about uh, gravity uh, not existing in the quantum world for instance and the properties of gravity at, at a macroscopic world and the surface world as they call it and a lot of things like that right i find that very spiritually engaging uh, but somewhere you know it's not really gone to a level where it, it it really appeals to the masses in that sense is it because we have not made that effort david to go go that extra mile to take these concepts and explain it to these people or is it that we are you know as science communicators we are at operating at a different level and you know we are not able to sort of you know connect these two worlds and see the look make the other side see uh, things from this standpoint is is there a deficiency there from a communication perspective there can be at times i mean mm-hmm. i have certainly in in the past i found myself sometimes being quite dismissive of mm-hmm. people's things and i you know you always look back at your behaviors and your 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 habits and kind of go could i do better mm-hmm. and i feel that you don't ever you know you can say deficiency but sometimes in historically there's often been conflict between religious forces and scientific forces because you know it, it seems who has predominance over reality can sometimes be the argument but i think oftentimes that argument can be avoided mm-hmm. i think if you want people who are naturally leaning towards religion to be more accepting of science you have to do it in such a way as that you don't denigrate their belief or make them feel stupid you never actually change someone's mind anyway you solely give them the tools to make their own um reasons and rationales so i think that there is blame both ways but i think all we can always hope to do is to communicate better and better until a mutual understanding is reached and i think that goes for a lot of things right the communication is indeed something that all of us need to work much on but but david this is specifically targeted at people who are really misusing science like people who yeah. talk about the heisenberg uncertainty principle being an <laughs> an example of you touched upon this in your book as well i do remember that part in the oh yeah yeah right? deepak chopra that's uh, Deep- that's one of that was one of his close classics yes. yeah i didn't want to take names Uh, but then again this is like uh, what do you t- talk about people like like him and others who are somewhere you know using the f- principles of uh, physics to or rather applying it in a sort of context that where it doesn't really belong yeah so that's 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 often at the case so people like science has an implicit uh, societal authority whether it should or not we can discuss this there's often cases where it shouldn't but mm-hmm. you know people if you put a stamp that says this is science on it and we've seen this with covid-19 governments love doing this when they've done something whether they should or not they often go that's what the science says like it's some <laughs> arcane authority science is a method of inquiry what people like deepak chopra do is they engage in cargo cult science to make their ideas which are a little bit tired and a bit old um right. seem seem more relevant and seem more you know rigid they borrow the clothing of science to put on them So, you know, if you have this Taoist religious belief, which is a very old thing, you might mm-hmm. try to dress that up with quantum mechanics because it makes it sound like, oh, quantum mechanics agrees with me. But that is very it's very much um, you know, an inappropriate comparison. So I think right. people need to be wary as well. And this is something we can all learn. We need to be wary of when people present something as scientific, that itself is a very ambiguous and nebulous adjective. we need to be careful because a lot of people who are selling you snake oil will also <laughs> claim it's scientific if it helps right. their case so there's a little bit of learning what science is and what science is not so that when we read deepak chopra we can go this guy is talking absolute nonsense <laughs> you know um so just teaching people how to spot them um right. but that's also cuz that's a good thing in one way cuz it just mm-hmm. means people do respect science but that also yes. means it can be abused so it's really important to find the happy middle ground where science is recognized for science and nonsense is recognized for nonsense which is a harder question sometimes than we'd right. like now absolutely david and when when we stretch this or have extend this to the realm of politics you know uh, especially <laughs> considering what's happening around us these days uh, oh, yeah. science is not really getting too much support uh, from from higher ups especially in elected or rather representative democracies where you know there is a counter narrative being ran sort of galvanized their uh, audiences and people so what do you say about that is 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 this kind of disservice 
really harming the cause of science? Coming well, there's a, actually, there's a really good example in India, which you probably saw recently, that one of the government health departments um, for COVID-19 started pushing homeopathy as a treatment. Mm-hmm. And that was interesting because it was an official communication that mm-hmm. seemed very legitimate. And obviously, COVID-19 is terrifying. People are scared. We don't know what's happening. Mm-hmm. It was very strange for them to do this because they put it in such authoritative tones that if you didn't know better you would think Mm -hmm. this is an effective treatment for COVID-19. I can inform your listeners that homeopathy is probably good for dehydration and very little else because it is effectively water and and nothing else but obviously someone with their own agenda in that Mm -hmm. department wanted this accepted. It was an interesting thing because I thought that was an abuse of the department's function. That individual person in the department or that individual group of ministers, whoever else, they may have believed that homeopathy was beneficial to them. But it was Mm -hmm. irresponsible to communicate Mm -hmm. that to the public as if Mm -hmm. this was known. And you see it across uh, in in America, Donald Trump naming different drugs, telling, saying everyone should take them. Absolutely not, because that's not what the evidence said. And yet people did and people got sick or people didn't get any benefit. So I think that there is a responsibility if you are in a position of authority uh, mm-hmm. over you know, an administration, particularly in politics, you mm-hmm. should be tied to the evidence or at least be mm-hmm. able to say, we're going with this because our evidence says this. Mm-hmm. And with, with the caveat that evidence always evolves, like you might think, well, this works very well one day and that actually we got more evidence. This is now not great. So we're moving on. That's how science always works. But I think mm-hmm. politicians often use science, they use science the way a drunk person uses a lamppost. <laughs> they use it for they use it for support rather than illumination. You know, they they, they 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 graft to it to, to try and make everything look legitimate rather than to say what's the answer to this question. That's mm-hmm. something we have to be very wary of. The politicization of science is is really unhealthy, because okay, everything is political to some degree, but mm-hmm. you see in America the arguments about masks have become political. They shouldn't. They should be based on the evidence, but somehow it's become oh Trump is anti-mask, so therefore. You know, masks are bad if mm-hmm. you're if you're a Republican and uh, masks are the best thing ever if you're a Democrat. And the answer is somewhere in between. But politics shouldn't come into it. But it does. And we have to be so careful of that because facts, you know, mm-hmm. look, everyone has entitled to an opinion, but facts should be sacred. You're not entitled to your own facts. And yet somehow we've created a system where people can just cherry pick the narrative they want and then pretend they're supported by the evidence. And that is just not the case. Oh, that's well, well put, David. The cherry picking is what always, you know, <laughs> hurts and causes more problems than it solves. Actually, going going back a few decades, uh, David, when when the Cold War was on and you had this, you know, bipolar world where you had these mm. two blocks, you know, which have sort of you know, poised at uh, at hair trigger to you know uh, launch a nuclear strike against uh, both of them. And somewhere there's a belief that in those days, even though uh, the world was always at the brink of another big war, but there was always this reliance on science in a much larger way. Uh, if you notice the way we have gone to the moon, and there was a lot of developments that happened because there was this, mm. you know, race that was always on uh, on the arms side and on science in general as well uh, between USA and the Soviet Union uh, on both sides. Uh, but somehow we seem to have lost that motivation uh, now that we come out of the Cold War. And things are still slightly unsettled and, you know, there are still so many hotspots around. But science has really lost uh, an opportunity and and it, it sort of, you know, faded into the background since the Cold War ended. Is that something you believe in as well? In some ways, it's maybe not as an obvious. Um, mm-hmm. But I think a lot of the Cold War science, the big things, were done in some ways a not scientific spirit. So to clarify that. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like to view science as international, as progressive, as for the betterment of, of, of humankind and indeed, you know, the world. Mm-hmm. But if you look at a lot of the Cold War science, whether it was part of the space race or mm-hmm. the weapons development we saw, a lot of that was towards very aggressive means. I think the kind of science, and, and it's very obvious, it's done in an obvious way. It's done to intimidate and to electrify and to inspire. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of the science we're seeing now Mm-hmm. is still really, really good, but it's more incremental. It's smaller, but it's probably more lasting in some ways. I mean, if you look at cancer survival between the 1980s and now, 
-hmm. it's gone up massively. You know, diseases that would have killed you in a year if you were diagnosed in 1980, you're going to live 10, 20 years if you were diagnosed in 2020. That doesn't capture the imagination quite the way man jumping around on the moon does. Right. But it's all part, it's, it's all part of things. Um, I think what's really important is science also goes through sometimes periods of what appear to be a latency. Mm -hmm. So, for example, sometimes to make huge developments, there's a lot. Like I always point out, we have this obsession with the great man of science image where, you know, the person who discovered this and this great person. But mm -hmm. science is kind of like building a house right or building a shed you're all you're all putting bricks on you're all putting bricks on you're building up knowledge you're finding out what works what doesn't work the person who puts the last last brick on might get the credit but actually they couldn't have done that unless all the other bricks were there so right. science science is largely incremental and it's happening all the time and it might not be bang 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 lasers and guns <laughs> and everything obvious but that right. doesn't take away from its utility so I think that Cold War science was more obvious and maybe more I, I mechanical in one way, more like a steer. You could see it straight away. Um, if someone builds a giant nuke, yeah, you know all about it. You know, if someone puts satellites up into space because they're creating a weapon system, you know all about it. But I, I think that actually, if anything, I think things have been more international, more collaborative. Certainly all the science I've done, I have I have worked very closely with people from all around the world, including people from India. And like that didn't happen as much in the Cold War era. I think that's a beautiful thing that everyone comes together and goes, what do we need to solve? And it's a bit quieter, but it's definitely happening. So I, I'm a bit more optimistic than you there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's really good to hear, David, because I guess uh, the Iron Curtain was a real thing. There was definitely mm. a huge barrier uh, against it collaboration. Was a scary time. Yeah. It was a huge barrier. And like, uh, as I point out in the book, there was a frightening amount of times the world almost ended because someone did something stupid or Absolutely. thoughtless. And I, I I hope we never go back to that again, because yeah. um, I quite like the world for all its flaws and I prefer it not to be nuked. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the amount of times that almost happened. And right. we need to, as humans, learn never again. We need to prioritize our similarities, not our differences. But humans are very good at identifying on differences and maybe less good at going, hey, what about all the stuff we have in common? But right. the, the, nar the narcissism of small differences is a, is a term I've heard used, and I'm going to steal it because it, <laughs> make, it makes me sound clever, but I, I like it. So that, that, is, that is the irony of, of the times that we are living in, that you know, genetics has clearly unraveled a world that, is, that consists of people who are connected at so many levels. There is... There, there, there never was a us versus them. It's it's all of us part of the same lineage of people who walked out of Africa because of certain climatic factors or whatever was it that drove them, right? So that information is so clearly available to people like never before, uh, thanks to all these uh, you know companies that are offering these uh, genetic tests and things like that, uh, 23andMe and what have you. We're mongrels. We are as a species. We are like we're all from the same place. We're all inbred to huge degrees. There is so little difference between humans that literally, you know, and it's yeah. funny what we get hung up on these like yeah. tiny aesthetic differences like, oh, someone has more melanin or less melanin than yes. me. and on a scale of things. Who cares? <laughs> but yet Absolutely. people do, you know, they do for weird reasons. People are strange. Yeah. That, 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 that maybe that strangeness is built into us from an evolutionary perspective is is that a way a psychological that... there was an interesting study done and i, I can't remember the author because off the top of my head but they uh -huh. basically they took school kids and they randomly assigned them into groups and um, sometimes like the team red and the team blue mm -hmm. and these groups developed hatreds for each other they were randomly oh. assigned um they've done there's been smaller versions of this with eye color where the teacher sorts people by eye color and treats them differently and mm -hmm. it kind of engenders a sense mm -hmm. of bias or whatever so i think sometimes again this is we focus on the small differences between us instead of the huge similarity i've been i've been reading a book on this recently it's an old book but it's quite good it was called guns germs and steel and uh, it's, it's jared diamond is the author yes and he, he talks about why um you know and I do. I sometimes you deal with these. I, this is like an oxymoron. Scientific racists, you know, people who claim that there's a scientific basis for, you know, mm -hmm. racial discrimination. There is not, by the way, but they love mm -hmm. claiming that. 
he talks about why why did like white Europeans become so dominant around the world, mm-hmm. and almost all of it was circumstance. Like uh, it, it was, a, and he, he his thesis is really well. It's a beautiful book. It's really well laid out, and it's very technical. You know, for years, say these colonizers would have had a very superior attitude, but actually mm-hmm. they just were in a circumstance where they had the the happy coincidence of things that allowed them to become these terrible people, so to speak. If you okay. break them, you know, I mean, and we we I, I deal a little bit with with them um, racism in the book or or pseudo scientific pseudo race or scientific racism, which is it's pseudo scientific, of course. Mm-hmm. How people have tried. To, for example, um, you deal with white nationalists around the world who'll say things like the white race are special. The right, right. like the, the 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 mutations that allowed very white skin are relatively recent and required a huge amount of crossbreeding from people from Central Europe, people from Southeast Asia, people from mm-hmm. Sweden. Like it just goes back to underscore that humans are the same species. These kind of rationalizations are so stupid that they're not even rationalizations. But it is interesting that um, there's not more awareness of this because in if we look at America in particular and see, mm-hmm. and that obviously politics is a huge thing there as well because you know the, the, the institution of slavery was accepted so widely in America for so long. It's funny mm-hmm. we're still seeing the consequences of that now. It's it's really bizarre, but there is no scientific justification for any of that whatsoever. True. So um, moving on, uh, David. So how was it like growing up in Saudi Arabia? When is it that you connected with science? That that should be an interesting story in itself. Oh wow! I am. Uh, have have I connected with science? I'm still not uh-huh. sure. Um, I dabble. I dabble as best I can. But okay. growing up in Saudi Arabia was interesting. An interesting place. I'm trying to find words that I don't want to be too harsh to it. Mm-hmm. But Saudi was a country that was was a loose affiliation of tribes, then found oil, then got mm-hmm. immensely rich. Mm-hmm. But one of the way the state was formed was an uneasy alliance between the House of Saud and the, uh, I think it's bin Bayaz, was the, was the religious side who were allowed to control it. So mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia, for example, had uh, Matawas, Mutawin, religious policemen. The law is very a strict interpretation of Islam. About 5% of all Muslims in the world are Wahhabi. It's a very, very strong version of Sunni Islam. Um, and it's incredibly literal. It's, 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 it's like, it's, I, I, you could describe it as Islamic fundamentalism, the same way in parts of America you have Christian fundamentalists or, you know, any kind of fundamentalist, mm-hmm. which meant that it was a very uneasy country to go to. Women were treated very, very poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, pe- people from the Philippines and India were treated very, very poorly. Mm-hmm. Um, like when I was a young child, when my mother went out, she had to cover up and everything else, wear the abaya, wear the coverings. I was four years old and considered her guardian because I was a man, which is mm-hmm. bizarre. Given that I couldn't put my own pants on properly, that's a bit of a situation. It, it was frightening, though, because of that. I think that's a good example where religion can keep things backwards because that stunted uh, their progression. I met beautiful, wonderful people in Saudi, but mm-hmm. the environment of the country uh, mm-hmm. was very oppressive, very frightening. And as a young child, it would make you very anxious. You know, and, and as I've got older and I've lived in other countries and I've lived with Muslim people, you realize that you know, this is not what most Muslim people are like or what, what most teachings of Islam teach. This is a very strict, rigid version Mm-hmm. But I guess Ireland was under a very, very strict version of Catholicism for a lo- long time that didn't allow you to read certain books or didn't allow certain things to happen. So mm-hmm. I think that whenever religion goes fundamental and decides to impose laws on people, that's mm-hmm. an issue. But it certainly it was eye opening. And I tell you something that helped me understand. I talked mm-hmm. about it a bit in the book. Um, I didn't understand the obviously growing up in Saudi, it gives you a bit of an insight into Middle Eastern politics. And how complicated it is. There's not a simple story. So after September the 11th, and everyone was talking about, you know, Al Qaeda and everything else. I was used to Al Qaeda. They were operated in Saudi. They were they were from Saudi. You know, we had to be careful about them. And okay. it made it very interesting to see the world and some of the narratives. People would say things like, um, "Oh, Iraq are are involved in this," and I instantly knew that that was entirely unlikely, given that Iraq and uh, you know. 
Iran would have incredibly different history, genetics, ethnicities, beliefs. Mm-hmm. It was a weird thing to listen to American commentators say all like how these things were connected. And I would go, yeah, if you've lived in the Middle East, you'd know that's not connected at all, or it's way more complicated <laughs> than that. So it gave me some insight there. I remember thinking like, I'd hear scary stories from American commentators about these, they used to try to link Iraq and you know the 9-11 attacks. And I'd stop and go, no, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Like it, 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 it's such a stretch. It makes no sense. And of course, it didn't make sense. It was, it was an attempt to politicize something. So I guess mm-hmm. you know, that was one good thing. It gave me a little bit more skepticism about hearing people talking about it. And who do you look up to, David? In terms of who are your idols, icons, so to say, who inspire you and you know bring out this thought process in you? Uh, if I had to pick anyone, my parents. I know it's a stupid answer. Um, but it's like, not, uh, yeah. you know, but it, it's, it's, they always encourage, like, they've always encouraged me to do whatever I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. And I got like, I, I, my background, I do music, I do theater, and I got very into science, but they mm-hmm. never put pressure. They always just, you know, allowed me, my mother is a nurse and my father is an engineer. Mm-hmm. And they've always just encouraged curiosity, encouraged practicing your talents, encouraged expanding your mind. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they've done that without putting pressure on me to do it like I mean I I have other friends who excelled scientifically but maybe under a lot of parental pressure Mm -hmm. I was in a nice situation that my parents said do you like this if you like it keep doing it and if you don't and if I stop tomorrow they'd Mm -hmm. accept that too so if I had to pick anyone who's done it yeah the the, the two of them um if I had to pick someone more you know as as different figures I've had plenty of inspiring uh colleagues in my life who probably wouldn't be well known but have encouraged me and, and helped me out. I've had amazing friends. And I've had figures like, for example, I owe um, Richard Dawkins and, and Robin Ince and Simon Singh uh, a great deal because the three of them, for example, have always encouraged my writing and been very helpful. When the paperback mm-hmm. of the book comes out, Richard Dawkins has a has a, a recommendation on the front and Robin yes. Ince has the one. And it's and like that's very kind. That that's good too. So there's so many people that have contributed to me being any way near productive. I couldn't <laughs> narrow it all down. <laughs> but here is what uh, Dawkins actually uh, says about you: that if our leaders were forced to read uh, this book, the world would be a safer place. So now that's high praise, as Nicholas Cage would say. I mean, yeah. Amazing. I like the fact that you reference Nicholas Cage as well. That's made me happy. <laughs> Because there's this SNL skit, I don't know if you've seen it, where they speak about um, there's somebody who comes in as as Nicolas Cage, who pretends to be Nicolas Cage, and he he keeps on interviewing people, and and his his uh, catchphrase is this actually, you know, that's high praise. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's quite interesting. But this is this is really high praise in whichever way you look at it, because I mean, uh, Richard Dawkins is of course he's he's beyond everything in terms of you know, who he is and what he's what been doing it a long time. Yeah, he, right? he knows his stuff. I'll give him that. He knows his stuff. Yeah. He's a very approachable man. He's um, I know people have his reputation of Richard is very scary. Actually, mm-hmm. my dealings with him, he's always been lovely. I, I don't know how you you put up with the abuse that he gets on social media or whatever else and, and stay that lovely because I even find that hard. And, right. you know, but in the fact, he's always been encouraging and I've always, um, I'm very grateful to him and Simon Singh and Rich and Robin Ince in particular. David, what's, what's keeping you busy these days? So what am I doing at the moment? Well, mm-hmm. I have been working, so the, there's translated versions of the book, which mm-hmm. uh, different authors from, I think the, uh, the, I'm dealing with the Chinese translations at the moment, obviously I can't, but it's interesting how they ask questions and you go, oh yeah, I, I could phrase that better. Or I could change it. So I'm doing that, preparing the paperback version. Uh, I've started drafting an idea for another book, but we'll see. I ain't done. And um, at the moment, I lecture a lot. So even though I don't have students at the moment, I've been doing a lot of my own research as well. I've published a few papers coming out soon on um, cancer research topics and also science communication topics. And that's keeping me uh, off the street, as they say. But lockdown is an interesting time for us, I think, through COVID-19. We've all been forced to re-examine what we want to change, what we don't like, what we do like. So I'm, I guess the most diplomatic answer I can give is that I'm kind of feeding my way and working out when all this is a bit reduced and the severity has gone down in a few months time, Mm -hmm. what would I like life to be like? What, what do I want to occupy my time with? Mm -hmm. And 
so I, I guess a lot of thinking which is not always comfortable but it's important that's great david and how do you see covid-19 panning out in the next 6 to 12 months if if a a, a guesstimate so to say could be made in terms of how it will move oh, it's a, it's a hard one and i wouldn't put um, any huge money on it at the moment <laughs> i suspect because the virus can um reservoir in other species mm-hmm. it's not something we can socially like if this was something like smallpox okay thank god it's not smallpox but if it mm-hmm. was something like that that only affected humans and its only natural reservoir was humans you mm-hmm. could make everyone stay at home for 2 months and it would be gone but mm-hmm. because it has animal reservoirs and it originally origin that's probably not going to happen with this we're looking at uh, control contain and ideally vaccinate so i mm-hmm. think a lot uh, or, or or treat i mean both of these things are are viable Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's going to boil down to us developing better treatments, mm-hmm. understanding it a bit better, and I would be vaguely hopeful we might get a vaccine. Now, I think the quickest vaccine we've ever developed took 4 years. Um wow. and but hopefully this will be quicker because of the amount of research effort going into it. At the same time, developing a vaccine is no easy thing. Like people are going, "Oh, there'll be a vaccine in 12 months." I I don't know if there will be. I, I mean, I've heard other people say maybe 7 years. Um and these are all immunologists i respect and i i i read their their work the point is it's complicated and we don't know but in the interim mm-hmm. we do have to make a, a conscious effort to modulate our behaviors to avoid you know unnecessary risks but at the same time we have to also find a way to accommodate the natural flow of life because it is not sustainable to lock down forever okay. uh, but it it's also not sustainable to take foolish risks So a happy medium has to be struck. I don't know how we're going to do that on mass, mm-hmm. but we better we better bloody well learn because we're seeing like Ireland has stabilized a little bit, but second wave could come tomorrow. The US mm-hmm. still is at peaking and going up and down. I think it the pattern is going to be complicated. And I think that it's going to come a time we'll a lot of us will get it. The vast majority of us it'll be mild. We don't want to all get it at the same time. because if we get it at the same time you overwhelm your entire health system so mm-hmm. while it still exists we have to take cautions and once we can start treating it or even preventing it that'll be great when that's going to happen oh i could make a lot of money if i knew <laughs> but i'm afraid i do not <laughs> your final thoughts david on as part of this conversation for all our listeners everywhere in terms of how they should also develop an approach to life that where they can avoid these you know irrational paradigms or whatever comes their way how can they keep these things aside and develop a more objective way so to speak and when i speak about the audience i speak for me as well because obviously <laughs> this is yeah. coming yeah. from me as well so that's a really it's a really good question i'm not sure i'm even qualified to answer it what i would say is make a it, it's an idea to make a checklist we're of of our toolbox for ourselves Mm-hmm. Uh, to deal with misinformation and to and to wonder how we should assess information i think that's the most important thing we can learn because we live in an era where we have the access to the world's repository of information at our fingertips and yet at the same time we've never had more falsehood more disinformation more misinformation being pushed at us and very emotively and very powerfully so the things i'd say when you come across information to ask yourself a few questions mm-hmm. one of which is why is this being said Mm-hmm. you know is this being said to push a political point or is this just you know uh, where is it from and i think the most important question is where are you getting this from so if someone tells you covid-19 is caused by 5g it's not <laughs> uh, you you might say is that from the who or is that from the cdc or is that from some internationally recognized body and if the answer to that is no well then probably be suspicious basically what we should always aim to do is reflect before we react because there's a human urge to go ooh that's scary i better tell someone it's more important and it's it, it's the availability heuristic it sticks in our head because it's memorable but what we should actually say is i am going to have no opinion on this for now i'm going to ask some questions and if i feel that is something after i've done my own like little check on the veracity of those things i've checked the sources um then i might disregard it or i might say that is that is not true and i won't be sharing that i essentially say that we all need to be a bit skeptical even from our friends our family and i love my friends and family but they have shared some absolute nonsense to me in time and i'm sure i have by accident to them in the past 
Um, it's it's oh, this, the last thing I'd also say. It's really important. We have to realize our ideas are not us. Our ideas should evolve. Our ideas don't reflect anything about the quality of us. Our beliefs should change as we get more information. That should be a good thing. If you find out you were wrong about something, you go, ha, I was wrong about that. Okay, I'm going to not be wrong again about that. Um, instead of what we tend to do is we tend to identify ourselves with our beliefs. So I believe that. So the person telling me it's wrong is a liar or they're diminishing me or I'm mad at them. No, we need to de-escalate the emotion from facts. And we need to go, right, there's no harm in being wrong and at the same time be compassionate to ourselves and others because it's a fine line i often get that one wrong there's a fine line between you know being understanding and and being too harsh the point is we need to give people the freedom to change their own mind and that includes us we need to give ourselves the freedom to go you know the belief i held yeah it's not right so i'm going to change it and there shouldn't be any punishment there shouldn't be any gloating we should just go fantastic I am delighted to hear you say that. That's that's great, David. And isn't that exactly the way in which science progresses, actually? That, you know, we keep moving on. And, you know, there Absolutely. are theories that have been uh, falsified, but people have just accepted it and said, hey, that's fantastic that we have got something better than what I had conjured or I had come up with, right? So A hundred percent. And the world suddenly makes more sense. And you're not holding yourself to a, a belief that is is harming you effectively because wrong-headed beliefs cause us harm we're trying to minimize right. harm here for everyone and we we can only do that by accepting that we are often wrong accepting right. that others are often wrong and going it's okay as long as we move towards being less wrong absolutely david and this intellectual rigidity is what is harming us more than we can imagine that you know we stick to our stance right or wrong you, because no absolutely we egos yes. you might e <laughs> you might e you might even say that this intellectual rigidity is not very intellectual. So I agree entirely. <laughs> there you go. It's just rigidity by some other name, right? David? There you go. Stubbornness. I mean, uh, obstinacy or something. I don't know. It's. Uh, I certainly do it at times. Everyone does it at times. So we have to move away from it. And there's no shame. There's only shame in not changing your mind when the evidence tells you you should. There you go. There's absolutely no shame in admitting you were wrong, and. You should be happy that you have been exposed to the truth or whatever is the truth at that point in time. Absolutely. Wonderful, David. Thanks a lot for being here with us. I'm sure a lot of listeners who have read you before or who are going to read you will find this conversation very interesting. And you've come in at the right time, David, more importantly, when we are searching for a lot of answers in terms of what is going on around us uh, with, with, with respect to COVID-19, with respect to politics, with respect to our daily lives also, where a lot of us have started working from home or have, have our lives changed in such a significant way. I'm sure people like you who are, you know, holding these beacons for the rest of us in terms of how to move towards, a, you know, less rigid thinking and embrace newer paradigms and see how we can move forward with optimism while doing everything that we are doing and also give a lot of uh, space for other opinions to develop some of which might become theories in, in the near future. Thanks for joining us, David. It's been fantastic having you with us. Uh, absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Take it easy. Thank you, David. So there you have it. I hope this conversation and the book will serve as an eye-opener and drive some degree of introspection and situational awareness in our audience, especially when we confront situations where there's a need to react immediately. The book is called The Irrational Ape, and it's available in bookstores everywhere. Don't forget to reach out to My Bookworks to grab your copy today. Hope you liked today's show. Please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you have connected with us. Be sure to join me for the next edition where we'll be speaking to another inspiring guest. Till then, stay alert, awake and thoughtful. And don't forget, perseverance is optional. Take it easy.